Hello everyone, welcome back to Explore China, Tanzua Jongor. It is Enrico Cordes here from Mannheim, Germany. This video will be the first solely podcast and I will be introducing to you Chinese characteristics or Jongor and the Chijie written by Arthur Henderson Smith and from 1894. So first of all, how did I came across this book? I found it in Shanghai's book town, Shanghai Shucheng Fuzhou Dian, which is a very large bookstore in the center of Shanghai. And I saw this Chinese characteristics and I thought, oh, wow, this looks interesting. I only know the socialism with Chinese characteristics, but I didn't know that there was existing a book with uh, this title. And now, first of all, a few facts to the author. The author was born in Connecticut in the US in 1845 and he died in 1932. He spent a total of 54 years in China and he was sent to China in 1872 where he should be a missionary of the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions. And then at the time of already living for roughly 20 years in China, then this book, Chinese Characteristics, was uh, published in a Chinese edition in China for the North China Daily News of Shanghai. And then four years later in 1894 in the US. And I will be uh, beginning to quote uh, at the back of this book, uh, Lydia Liu, he, uh, she, she wrote, it was, the first to, it was the first to take up the task of analyzing Chinese society in the light of scientific, social and racial theory. So... And inside this podcast, I will be introducing to you this book by Arthur Henderson Smith, how he describes the Chinese characteristics and the Chinese society in the late 1900s. And I will be showing to you only a few what I think are maybe the most interesting parts of his book and out of his many chapters. And also the during this time, the famous... Chinese author Lu Xun, he also praised this book and he thought it's important for Chinese uh, scholars and his students to read this book and to see like the, the Western view or this American view on China. And now let's start with the introduction. And before I will go on, I have to say that everything I will be saying now is straight out of, uh, out of this book and not my personal opinion or my personal words. So let's start with the introduction. And um, Arthur Henderson Smith, he starts with no single individual could by any possibility know the whole truth about the Chinese. And thus he avoids strict definitions and describes a Chinaman by his most prominent qualities. And he further says about himself that the author has no adequate qualifications for writing it. The circumstance that a person has lived for 22 years in China is hardly enough, but is certainly not entitled to generalize for the whole empire. And then what, they, what this book is intended to be is merely a notation of the impression which has been made by one observer by a few out of many Chinese characteristics. And he further says, the difficulty of comparing Chinese with Anglo-Saxons will be most strongly felt by those who have attempted it. And he, he gives us an uh, insight in how we can learn about Chinese characteristics and Chinese society, he says, according to him, we can come to some knowledge of their social life by the study of their novels, their ballads and their plays and above all the family life of the Chinese in their own homes. And he states this with uh, an example, a foreigner can live in a Chinese city for a decade and not gain as much knowledge of the interior life of the people as he can acquire by living for 12 months in a Chinese village. And now personally, I think I can agree to this because life in Shanghai and Beijing is probably very different from a second, third or fourth tire city in China or in a very small rural village. And yes, so the Chinese question, he says, there is a reason to think that in the 20th century, it will be an even more pressing question than at present. And this was in the late 1900. 
And now for me, I think, yeah, in the first, in the 21st century, it's even more pressing question. And then he starts his book with the first chapter, which is called Face. Henderson Smith starts to explain face by saying face is a compound noun of multitude with more meanings than we shall be able to describe. The Chinese have a passion for theatrics like that of the Englishman for athletics or the Spaniard for bullfights. To an Occidental seem to make such actions superfluous, not to say ridiculous. The question is never of facts but always of form. Probably to execute acts like these in a, all the complex relations of life is to have faith, to fail of them, to ignore them, to be thwarted in the performance of them, this is to lose faith. The principles which regulate faith and its attainment are often wholly beyond the intellectual apprehension of the Occidental, who is constantly forgetting the theoretical element and wandering off into the irrelevant regions of fact. To him, it often seems that Chinese faith is not unlike the South Sea Island taboo, deserving only to be abolished and replaced by common sense. At this point, Chinese and Occidentals must agree to disagree. To offer a person a handsome present is to give him faith. To be accused of a fault is to lose faith, and the fact must be denied, no matter what the evidence, in order to save faith. This is like the most um, important or most basic what he's saying about face. And now I would continue with the second characteristic he mentioned, and this is economy. I think to describe economy in China during this time, the best quote of Smith was, they seem to be able to do almost everything by means of almost nothing. So he gives us a few different examples and he starts with saying extremely simple diet of the people but then on the other hand they have wholesome food in abundant quantity at a cost for not more than two cents a day. This implies the general existence of a high degree of skill in the preparation of food, in the cooking and serving of what they have. The Chinese are past masters of the culinary art. There is very little waste in the preparation of Chinese food and everything is made to do as much duty as possible. And then all this food is also sold and is everything all eaten. And also the children, they were economic-wise uh, doing, yeah, working. Every smallest child who can do nothing else can at least gather fuel. And then there was another instant, he, he quotes... Do you wash your child every day, said an inquisitive foreign lady to a Chinese mother, who was seen throwing shovelfuls of dust over her progeny, and then wiping it off with an old broom. Wash him every day, was the indignant response. He was never washed since he was born. And it is generally impossible to get any tool ready made. You get the parts in a raw shape and adjust the handles, etc. yourselves. And now personally, I think, well, this is a very interesting thing because now in China, what I experienced is that you can get everything in China just exactly as you want it. You have like a, a huge uh, service culture as well that you can just go on Taobao and then buy exactly the thing you want and they also bring it to you. And it's not like here that you have to, that they only get you the raw shape. And so this is something which changed severely to this uh, society today. And then uh, further he says, We have spoken of economical adjustments of materials such as found in ordinary houses where dim light, which costs next to nothing, is made to diffuse its darkness over two apartments by being placed in a hole in the divide dividing wall. And then the last thing he tells us here is no more characteristic instance could have been cited than the case of an old Chinese woman who was found hobbling along in a hobbling painfully slow way and on inquiry of whom it was ascertained that she was going to a home of a relative so as to die as in a place convenient to the family graveyard and thus avoid the expense of coffin bearers for so long a distance. And the third characteristic 
Henderson Smith is describing is industry. And he states, all at it and always at it. So he describes the Chinese people as a very hard, long-working uh, people. And he has that the Chinese, they classify themselves as scholars, farmers, workmen and merchants. And I will be focusing here on the scholar education part. And he says, in the education system, uh, it has no real rewards except for diligence. And there is an example of a grandfather, son and a grandson all are competing in the same examination for the same degree. And another instance uh, he saw in the province of Anhui, where 55 of the competitioners were over 80 years of age and 18 over 90. And then a uh, second point is this uh, of this hardworking toughness of the Chinese is, uh, he quotes, shops are always opened early and they close late. By the time an Occidental has had his breakfast, a Chinese market is already over. The fourth characteristic Henderson describes is politeness. The difficulty or occidental appreciation of Chinese politeness is that we have in mind such ideas as politeness is real kindness kindly expressed. But in China politeness is nothing of this sort. It is a ritual of technicalities which, like all technicalities, are important, not as the indices of a state of mind or of the heart, but as individual parts of a complex whole. The entire theory and practice of the use of honorific terms, that these expressions help to keep in view those fixed relations of graduated superiority which are regarded as essential to the conversation of society. They also serve as lubricating fluids to smooth human intercourse. Each antecedent has its consequent, and each consequent has its antecedent. When both are in proper order, everything goes well. There are very few Chinese who do not know what to do at any given time. He later states that this is hard for the foreigner to learn the rules and blend in. If the foreigner does not know the game, then it is, that it, then it is his own affair, not that of the host. It still remains true that we have much to learn from the Chinese and the item of social intercourse. And the fifth Chinese characteristic, Arthur Henderson Smith is describing the disregard of accuracy. And there's one, I think, quite funny instance he mentions, and this goes like this. Another somewhat pe peculiar fact emerges in regard to linear measurements, namely that the distance from A to B is not necessarily the same as the distance from B to A. It is vain to cite Euclidean postulates that quantities which are equal to the same quantity are equal to each other. In China, this statement requires to be modified by the insertion of a negative. We could name a section of one of the most important highways in China, which from north to south is 183 li in length, while from south to north it is 190 li. And singularly enough, this holds true no matter how often you travel it or how carefully the tally is kept. And then they found an explanation of this offered by an intelligent, intelligent native uh, was this. Carriage is paid on a basis of so many cash per mile. It is evident that a coolie ought to be paid at a higher rate if the road is uphill. Now it would be very troublesome to adjust the scale of wages writhing with the grad gradients of the road. It is much more convenient for all parties to assume that the road is difficult or precipitous places is longer. This is what has been done and these conventional distances are now all that the traveler will succeed in ascertaining. But, I protested, on the same principle, wet weather must elongate the road and it must be farther by night than by day. Very true, but a little extra payment adjusts that. This system may be convenient for the natives, but the travelers find it a, con a continual annoyance. The scale of distances is something like this. On level ground, one statue mile is called two li. On ordinary hill roads, not very steep, one mile is called 5 li. On very steep roads, one mile is called 15 li. The natives of Yunnan, being good mountaineers, have a tendency to underrate the distance on level ground. 
but there is so little of it in their country that the future traveler need sacredly trouble himself with the consideration. It will be sufficient to assume five locally, except in very steep places as being one mile. Smith also gives us here some more examples for the disregard of accuracy, but I think it is enough here for this uh, podcast because otherwise if I would go on it would be just too long and so I will be uh, uh, doing a cut here and in the next podcast I will be talking about the chapters the talent for misunderstanding and indirection the flexible inflexibility intellectual turbidity abscene of nerves and the contempt for foreigners and while I'm reading this here yeah it sounds all very negative and bad But this is how he saw and describes these Chinese characteristics in the late 1900s. And I would say just, yeah, let's have a look at it. And then see you next time. Goodbye.